finding the voices. Talk show by Monica Ingudam. A huge fan of finding the voices. You're doing a great job. Manipur. Good positive uh, voices and you know make those voices more visible. Yeah. Yeah. Our voice to reach in all the corners of the world. Finding the Interesting world. people. In finding the uh, finding voices on people the from our own place. Share positive stories and inspiring mm -hmm. stories and bring mm -hmm. all the good stories of Manipur. Finding the voices. Welcome to Finding the Voices. Right now, I am in Imphal and I am with Madam Irene Salam, who is a retired professor from Manipur University in history. Welcome to our show, Madam. Thank you, Monica. I'm very happy to be here with you this evening. And to start with, um, if you can share a little bit about, I would say more, more about <laughs> your introduction, starting from your childhood, education, and how you landed in Manipur. Okay, I think I have a very multicultural heritage because I'm born and brought up in UP, mm -hmm. one of the biggest states in India. But by ethnicity, I'm a Goan. Okay. So I have a fusion of North Indian culture with Goan culture. That was in my childhood. And uh, till I passed my post-graduation from Delhi University. And uh, shortly after that, in 1974, I got married uh, to a Mete from Manipur. Okay. Uh, we didn't have a Mete wedding. <laughs> And at that point of time, I didn't really know very much about Manipur. I came here in 1975. You came yes. <laughs> you <just> so <laughs> it was like a land, well, Sana Lai Bhak, the land of gems. So, right. you know, expecting to so find before something. Before you got married, you didn't come here. You didn't visit. No, I had never visited Manipur before I uh, came here in 1975. And at that time, there was in fact no information or no sensitivity about the states in Northeast India. Okay. People in the rest of India actually didn't even know the states that comprise Northeast India okay. or anything about the life and culture of the people. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was actually equally blank at that so time, was, point of time. So it was love that brought you here. Uh, yes. <laughs> My husband and me actually were together for five years in Delhi University. Mm. Yeah, he was in St. Stephen's and I was in Lady Sri Ram College. Okay. And of course, we opted for the same subject. We mm -hmm. were both in history. Mm -hmm. uh, we graduated and passed our master's at the same time from the same university. Okay. <laughs> so, after you landed in Manipur, what happened? Oh, uh, well, it was... Uh, in a way, it was a total transformation and maybe a kind of rejuvenation because I had no idea about uh, what Manipur would be like. And coming from a place like Kanpur, which has a population many times m over that of the entire population of Manipur state, mm -hmm. I found it a very tiny uh, little space okay. and um, many of the amenities which I had taken for granted and never actually inquired into when I came in 1975 I found there was a paucity of uh, essential amenities like running water. Mm. Uh, there was no gas at that time and mm -hmm. I had never seen these Petromax lanterns and mm -hmm. um, things like that. So it had to be a total adjustment to uh, adjust to the circumstances as they were. Okay. But since I had made this marriage out of my choice, I said when in Rome you do as the Romans do. Mm -hmm. And um, so we set up our own house. We didn't stay in the the ancestral house. Okay. No, my husband is the eldest uh, okay. son of the family 
and uh, we stayed in the same likai, in the same compound, but we stayed in a separate building, okay. you know, so we were independent right from the beginning. Okay, so yes. you didn't have the additional um, gelling in and binding in and... Oh, uh, well, I thought because I came from a family where we don't actually come from, uh, live in a joint family system mm -hmm. and uh, from a rather big uh, house and uh, uh, residence in Kanpur uh, where we were one of the founders. My family was one of the founders of that city mm -hmm. where we have a name, uh, road named after us and so on. Um, so I had insisted that we should stay separately mm -hmm. uh, because I think it's it's easier to bond with other family members mm -hmm. if each of you has your own independence. Mm -hmm. And moreover, my husband and me, not only being different communities, we also profess different religions. Mm. Uh, so that might have become problematic mm -hmm. if you know I were to stay in a joint family. Okay. Then lifestyle, patterns of eating, mm. uh, yeah, dressing, so on, okay. were quite different to that of the Manipuris. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so how did that work out? Oh, well, in the beginning, um, uh, my in, uh, mother-in-law was there. She's from, as you know, the royal family of Manipur, mm -hmm. Raj, Maharaja Churachan's daughter. Mm -hmm. So um, she thought that I would, uh, she was very religious and devotional and she would have liked me to, uh, you know, join the pujas every day mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, but I explained to her right from the very beginning uh, that religion is something personal mm, and personal yes choice. yeah it's a personal choice and I respect her uh, religion and uh, she needs to accord the same respect to mine because mm -hmm. I'm not changing my religion mm -hmm. and I have not married her some because of a particular religion but mm. because of the person he was and he's mm. also accepted me as I was right. yeah so uh, it would be better that you know this issue was resolved in the beginning mm -hmm. and I think it was resolved very amicably she understood it very well mm -hmm. and uh, in fact I had no pr uh, problem uh, performing my own uh, religious obligations being a Christian mm -hmm. and I think initially we were staying in uh, Sagolmand uh, and I probably was the only Catholic in that whole in locality, whole you know. Mm -hmm. So everyone it was to come out to see me going to church on okay. Sundays. It was like, a, you know, something very different for everyone. Okay, yeah. okay. So how did you cope up with the language and the people and food and... Uh, well, in the beginning, the language was very difficult to follow because I had not been used to any of the northeastern languages. Mm -hmm. And this, um, since the Manipuris come from a Mongolian stock, and it's a Tibetan Burman language, which I was not at all familiar with. Initially, I didn't try to pick it up at all because I had to get to used to the sounds and nuances mm -hmm. before I could figure out anything, you mm -hmm. know. So I took my time about it okay. and uh, fortunately since all my sister-in-laws and brother-in-laws had been educated in missionary schools, mm. um, they were all quite conversant in English. So you uh, didn't have the problem uh, yeah, of so immediate communication? Yeah, so that problem wasn't there except with my mother-in-law who didn't know English mm -hmm. or Hindi. Mm -hmm. But with the rest of the um, family members, mm -hmm. um, there was no problem at all. Mm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so what about the food? I know that you <laughs> stayed separately, but I just... Yeah. Well, of course, we were cooking our own food according to my style. And it took me a while to adjust to Manipuri food mm -hmm. because I had never eaten things like fermented soya bean mm -hmm. or fermented bamboo shoot. And initially, it was also difficult to digest it because mm -hmm. um, I wasn't used to that kind of uh, food. Okay. Uh, but I did like many of the Manipuri dishes like uti mm -hmm. and, you know, the other fishes like, you know, porong cooked with okay. uh, yeah those kind of uh, the fresh uh, fish dishes and all uh, but it took me a while to get used to these you know particular herbs or fermented food stuffs mm. now i'm quite used to <laughs> it you know so it I'm that, it's an yes taste. it's an acquired taste okay, yeah okay. especially fermented fish okay so now you eat irumba 
Oh, uh, well, I don't eat aroma because I have a problem with uh, uh, chilies, chilies now. Okay. I have a stomach uh, ailment, mm -hmm. so I can't have anything too chilly, and the aroma is always yeah. highly spiced. Right, <laughs> yeah. right, right. Yes, so how did your family take? you know y your decision to move to a place where you didn't even know and I'm sure they didn't <laughs> even know anything about it. Oh well uh, my father had already died before marriage. My mother wasn't too happy at all mm. and she did question my husband at length about you know. <laughs> so there was a big interview yes, before you yes, guys got Yes married. there was a long uh, uh, consultation and interviews and mm -hmm. it took uh, you know a period of two years to convince her okay. you know that uh, 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 I was going to go to stay in Manipur, a place which was quite unknown to us mm -hmm. and, you know, we're not used to it. And we had never traveled to the Northeast at all at that mm -hmm. point of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, but was there at any point of time after you came, um, you thought that maybe I should not settle in Manipur, you want to opt to stay some other place in India? No, I didn't think that because um, since I had uh, married out of choice, as I said before, uh, when in Rome you do as the Romans do. Mm -hmm. So once I got adjusted and, uh, to the life and the conditions of the Manipuri people, I mean all communities, um, uh, then I started looking around and decided that I wanted to uh, start working because mm -hmm. I was not used to just sitting at sitting home at and uh, thing. But it, since I needed a period of adjustment mm -hmm. uh, to Manipur, I I took two years before I started working. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So my eldest daughter was born before I started uh, working. working in the university. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then you started. Yeah. Working. Then I um, yeah somebody um, approached me and said, uh, in fact, that time Manipur University wasn't in existence. Mm. I was approached in 1977 and uh, asked to, you know, come and join the postgraduate center of Jawaharlal Nehru University, okay, which was, uh, yes, right. it was a PG center of JNU mm -hmm. in Delhi. Okay. Um, so I thought, uh, well, let me try. I had not thought of teaching as a career at that time. Mm. Uh, but I was approached by a friend and said, why don't you just come and try? Mm -hmm. So I went and worked as a guest lecturer for a period of six months. And then I found it suited me very well, right. perfectly. Okay. Yeah. So when the regular jobs were advertised by JNU, mm -hmm. six months later, I applied for the job and I was selected. Mm -hmm. So I was selected in 1978. But then in 1980, we converted into Manipur University. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have the option of going back to JNU Delhi. Okay. But then since I was based in Manipur, it didn't really make any sense to go back to Delhi and join mm -hmm. JNU. Uh, so I opted to, uh, you know, a shift to Manipur University. Okay, yeah. okay. And you just got <laughs> retired recently? Uh, yeah, I retired. My superannuation was on the 29th of 29th, February. 29th. <laughs> so it has been more than 30 years of yes. you working in Manipur University. Yes, more than three decades. More than three <laughs> decades. So can you share your experience in terms of the changes in infrastructure, also the student and any other uh, specific things um, during your tenure? Uh, well, in the beginning, it was uh, difficult um, lecturing the students because I found their fluency and understanding of the English language was rather limited. Okay. Um, and um, I remember in my first semester, I was asked to teach political thought, uh, which is rather theoretical mm -hmm. and uh, difficult for students to follow, especially if they don't have this fluency in the language. Okay. Um, so then I had to learn to take it very slowly and you know mm. repeat things mm -hmm. so that they actually grasp the concepts and the ideas. Okay. But over a period of time, you get adjusted to their way of thinking okay. and how they are translating from Manipuri into English, though so you're speaking in English, but they are doing a translation from Manipuri into English all the time, okay. you know. So uh, you get used to that technique. And um, uh, after, after a few years, I found that each batch uh, was in a way much smarter 
Um, the yes, the, uh, they the changed. Grasp yes, the in yes, a grasp of the language, even the whole uh, holistic education, because they were being exposed uh, to new knowledge, new technology like mm -hmm. the net, and you know now with the mobile phones mm -hmm. and Facebook, and you know they the were downloading media. so much material and mm -hmm. all. So of course, definitely they changed uh, quite radically. You mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And I think now they are at par with most of the students in any other part of India. Mm, that's really <laughs> nice to hear. Yeah. Monica, finding the voices. Finding the voices. Finding the voices. Finding the voice. 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 who came to me in my headmaster because he was unable to pay the fee. I'm sorry. Because we need such story for people to have faith in the government and the system that yes, it's working. Let's bring peace in our home state, people Manipur. Who have got uh, the job without bribery, mm -hmm. they'll do justice to their job and they will help raise the standard of Manipur. <laughs> so in Manipur particularly, um, I guess it has been going on for decades, but we see a lot of protests where uh, students are being included, students go in the forefront of the protest. So did you see that uh, from students of Manipur University, if you can share any experience on that? Oh, well, most of our students are again uh, very active, both socially and politically. Mm -hmm. So yes, if they okay. have a grievance or they want to sensitize people to a particular issue, uh, they do hold regular demonstrations and uh, they have had many which have been successful at one time for instance the student union was abolished mm -hmm. and uh, just two years back uh, because of the persistence of the students the mm -hmm. student union has been revived okay yeah in the university so we now again have a manipur university students, students union. union yeah okay, okay. Uh, but, but for a long time there was no union okay but is it uh, very often that it affects the schedule of the studies or I wouldn't say the student demonstrations in the university have impacted uh, the schedule of our classes it has more it has been more the endemic bans and blockades mm. and strikes which take place in Manipur which have actually disrupted our schedule okay. and especially for students coming from the hills and then have to come down to mm, the valley, to yes, the uh, yeah, like from different places. So that has disrupted uh, in many ways our schedule, you know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because we have read in the paper about uh, many of the schools being closed during you know some of the protesting period but i was not very sure about universities no college. that long period you're talking about when uh, rabina and sanjita were mm -hmm. killed at that time yes the schools were closed for a period of i think six months mm -hmm. but not the university not the we university. just had a few days okay. uh, but we carried on classes okay so yes it didn't actually affect us but for instance now say you decide on an admission test 
and suddenly they called uh, you know, there's a bank called the day before mm -hmm. so uh, well many of our applicants are from all the uh, districts of Manipur mm -hmm. then we need to postpone and you know everything gets delayed mm -hmm. and, uh, see so that has been happening on a regular basis okay yeah because we can't anticipate uh, when there is going to be a bond or a mm -hmm. uh, strike. Uh, okay, yeah. so there is a last minute. Uh, uh, lots of last min minute adjustments and yes, and then information we have to keep changing and mm -hmm. putting it on the news, you know, mm -hmm. that the te uh, admission test is postponed or, the, you know, this has been postponed. But you so haven't seen any improvement in this trend? Of, uh, yeah, of, of the impact in terms of you know this bun and no I think it seems to be on an increase oh because okay. uh, people have now taken it uh, if there's any issue the best way to resolve the issue is to call a strike or a bun so it has increased and hence it is affecting yes it does impact because it also impacts mobility to the university and back because mm -hmm. if public transport is not plying, mm -hmm. uh, most of the students are coming by public transport, especially mm -hmm. these autos. Mm -hmm. So if the autos are not plying, there is actually no way they can reach the university or come back either. Mm -hmm. So that definitely impacts. Mm -hmm. So with this frequent uh, bun and block it, we see that the schedule of test or admission, what you're talking about, it's being impacted. So has there been any time where, you know, the examinations or anything has been postponed that we could not make up in par with the national level? Actually, our exam schedule doesn't go along with the national schedule. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, slightly different because it's adjusted to the circumstances here. Okay. And uh, we usually have examinations during the vacations. So that even if something <laughs> takes place, you know, it can be adjusted to another day. Even in the last exam, <laughs> we had to shift, uh, you okay. know, the dates of the examination. But we usually have it during the summer and winter vacation. So uh, that's really that somehow it gets adjusted and we complete it before uh, the classes are actually scheduled to begin. Okay, so yeah. the people who have, uh, you know, whoever are uh, taking any course or they are actually completing it on time. Yes, we complete it on time because uh, many of us take extra classes okay. if we have missed out. But there are yeah. a lot of like the uh, teachers and uh, professors and students working uh, very closely, changing schedule and trying to meet it. But till now, we have been able to finish the course as scheduled. Yes, yes, we have been able to do that, make okay. those adjustments. Because everyone is aware that you don't know what tomorrow holds, you yeah, know. No, I am yeah. so. Um, <laughs> it's interesting to talk deeper and know how it works in the conflict situation. But yet, you know, everybody is trying to work and move forward. Yes. Like for example, during the ILP, um, I interviewed one of uh, uh, one of the entrepreneur, and he was saying that there is bun and blocker during the daytime, so they would sleep during the daytime and they worked at night night so it looks mm -hmm. like everybody is tweaking depending on the situation in Manipur but the work and progress has not stopped in some way in fact uh, talking about entrepreneurship uh, like last year I went for the uh, Northeast uh, annual history conference uh, which is held in all the different states of the Northeast so mm -hmm. last year we had it in Mizoram and I presented a paper on women entrepreneurs in mm -hmm. Imphal, mm -hmm. you know. And I think in the last decade, what I have been observing is that many of the Manipuris who have been studying outside, no matter what community they belong to, mm -hmm. or have been working outside and holding good jobs outside, mm -hmm. have suddenly decided to return home and to actually set up their own enterprises here. Mm -hmm. And I think you must have noticed now once in certain areas, right. um, there are a lot of new uh, malls, mm -hmm. of course, not comparable to those in developed countries and so on. 
but I think quite suitable for Manipur. Right, and, and it's a progressive. Yes, and I think it's a sign of progress. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of them are very successful. Mm -hmm. You know, many are selling like organic products. Mm -hmm. um, somebody is going in for something which is again different to others, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, there's a lot of change in the mindset of people here, mm -hmm. the young people especially. Mm -hmm. Now they're ready to take risks even though a decade ago the atmosphere was not conducive to entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. But despite the problems they have faced, they have now set up very good. Right. Uh, and it's coming up and like you said, we see the changes and I think it's very positive and I'm sure there'll be more coming up which will... Oh yes, I find that a lot of the uh, young students who are just passing out have their own ideas now what they would like to set up and mm -hmm. what they would like to do. Earlier they didn't really know no, they only wanted to just sit for the civil service examination. Mm -hmm. But now that it mindset is, is slowly changing. Of course, uh, civil service examination is still a priority mm -hmm. for most university students, right. especially from history, mm -hmm. because almost every history student sits for the civil service examination. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay. So, uh, but gradually I have been telling them it's not possible for all of you to get through. Right. Uh, no matter how intelligent, mm -hmm. uh, there is a limited vacancy. So you just can't all get in. So mm -hmm. you must think of some alternative. And uh, I, what I really tell my students is this. Uh, if you can't use your education practically, even if you've got your doctorate, you're basically literate and not mm -hmm. educated. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of try to push them into doing uh, something more positive. Right. So a couple of days ago, one of my postdoctoral students came down from Ukrul. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a long talk with him and then I encouraged him that, you know, you get all your uh, Tankul scholars there who have worked under me and we'll uh, you know, um, publish an, another two books, mm -hmm. you know, on things that people there have written mm -hmm. and their perceptions, mm -hmm. you know, about mm -hmm. uh, on different issues. Of course, it would be basically historical again, mm -hmm. but still, mm -hmm. you know. So that's something in the pipeline which we hope to produce in this year, another two books from there. Oh, that's very <laughs> exciting. And yeah. that is from Okrul. Okrul, so we'll from one of know. my postdoctoral students okay. who's, uh, uh, yeah, we would like to publish his PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would be editing that. Okay. He's already, he did his PhD from JNU, mm -hmm. not from here. And uh, he wants, he's just re revisiting and revising it. Mm -hmm. So once it's over, I'll er edit it again. Mm -hmm. And then we would give it to the publisher, okay. you know. Okay. And then there are other scholars who and college teachers who would like to write articles, research articles, which is actually now necessary in to increase their API, the mm -hmm. Academic Performance Index. Okay. Yeah, so this would give them an opportunity if we produced a book right. which has an ISBN tag and then right. their API automatically increases. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to sort of, I'm trying to focus on that, uh, you know, to help those kind of people now. Okay. Especially now that I'm retired, yeah. I'm thinking of actually uh, working more with uh, research scholars and uh, teachers. That's, that's and very exciting. <laughs> So the essays, what uh, you're talking about, it is obviously going to be relevant to uh, different uh, history and events in different part of Manipur. Yes, for the most part. For the most, um, for the most part. But mm -hmm. some uh, scholars, like one of my scholars is actually working on environmental history of Shah Jahanabad, mm. which is the last city built by the Mughals in Delhi. Okay. Yeah, okay. so that's a very different, uh, different thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, different topic. Uh, but she's a Mete girl who's uh, very intelligent mm -hmm. and she would be able to actually research in the archives and things in Delhi. Mm. So uh, I had actually assigned her this topic. Okay, <laughs> yeah. that's very interesting. So talking yeah. about books, um, just before uh, our prep, you did share about an upcoming book and some books you have published. Can yeah. you share a little bit about uh, your books? Yeah, well the book which we're just going to release um, this month in March, 
Um, it, I have edited this book. I've, I started it as a project when I was head of the department. And I wanted all the faculty members and our research scholars to take part in the project, mm -hmm. uh, basically to improve the research methodology of our scholars. Okay. Yeah, so I took it up as a uh, project. And now the book is ready for mm -hmm. a release. We have asked the um, Honorable Speaker of the Assembly to release mm -hmm. the book. And we hope to do it sometime this March. It's actually an, anthol an anthology of historical essays mm -hmm. uh, written by different faculty members, including myself, and a number of our research scholars. Mm. Uh, most of the topics are on Manipur, but there are a couple of topics which are all India. Okay, yeah. that's very exciting. <laughs> yeah. So I look forward to reading that book. Please join me at Finding the Voices.